Welcome to this very special poetry reading and discussion. My name is Catherine Gander and I'm Associate Professor of American Literature here in the English Department of Maynooth University in Ireland. Together with my colleague Dr Carl O'Hanlon, I am delighted to welcome you to the inaugural event in a series dedicated to poetry and poetics from across the world. This evening, or this afternoon for many of you, including our guest, we are honoured to host the world-renowned, multi-award winning American poet, Carolyn Forche. Before we begin, um, just a few small housekeeping items. This event is being recorded and it will last one hour. There will be time for the audience to ask questions in the second half of the event. Um, to do so, please write your question in the chat box. Um, you'll see the icon on the ribbon at the bottom of your screen. I'm sure you're all very familiar with Zoom by now. And Carl or I will pose the question on your behalf. We'll try to get through as many as we can. Um, we'd like to thank the English department at Maynooth for supporting this series. The um, department is headed by Lauren Arrington. Thank you also to Tracy O'Flaherty for helping to run this event behind the scenes. Thank you to you, the attendees, for joining us, especially in such extraordinary times and particularly during such a tumultuous week. And thank you, of course, to our esteemed guest, Carolyn Forche, for agreeing to share her work, her thinking and her time with us today. Carolyn Fauché is the editor of the landmark 1993 anthology Against Forgetting, 20th Century Poetry of Witness, and the author of the long-awaited memoir What You Have Heard is True, a memoir of witness and resistance, which chronicles her time in El Salvador in the late 1970s, in a time of civil unrest that would lead to a long and bloody civil war. She is author of five poetry collections. These are Gathering the Tribes, published when she was just 24 and winner of the Yale series of Younger Poets Award. The Country Between Us, which became that most rare of things, a poetry bestseller in 1981. Angel of History, which won the 1994 Los Angeles Times Book Award for Poetry. Blue Hour in 2013. And most recently in The Lateness of the World published by Blood Axe Books in the UK and Ireland in 2020. Many of the poems contained in these books speak of almost unspeakable things. The extremities of human suffering in war, torture, displacement and exile, the violations of human rights that happen under dictatorships, oppressive state institutions, military occupation, detainment and incarceration. But they are also infused with resistance, with love, with instances of such illumination as to fill you with awe and hope at the world's potential for peace and cohesion. In short, Carolyn Fauché's poems bear witness to humanity in its horror and its beauty. A trailblazing poet, essayist, translator and memoirist, a professor at Georgetown University and a tireless human rights activist, Carolyn Fauché will be reading to us today from In the Lateness of the World and talking to us about the stories behind the collection and what poetry can do in times of crisis. Carolyn, welcome. Thank you very much. I want to um, thank you all for coming and I send greetings across the Atlantic to Ireland. I miss Ireland very much and I will open my reading with two poems that were inspired by Irish people and experiences in Ireland. And the first one uh, has a little reference to the passage tombs, which all of you will easily recognize. But it's for an Irishman I knew, an Irish musician who in his travels didn't want to acquire little souvenirs. So he would uh, collect little stones from the ground of every place he went. And then he would mount them in, in a kind of wall museum and little blocks and prongs and label them such as a pebble from beneath the Eiffel Tower, 1977. And it was a beautiful thing to see, although the stones were perfectly worthless stones. Um, and I asked him if I could do it as well. And he, sure, everyone should have a museum. And so I began, but I wasn't organized. So what I have now is a, is a grocery sack filled with many kinds of stones from all over the world. Um, so I'd, I'd like to read this poem, Museum of Stones, as an invocation for the reading. 
These are your stones, assembled in matchbox and tin, collected from roadside, culvert, and viaduct, battlefield, threshing floor, basilica, abattoir. Stones loosened by tanks in the streets, from a city whose earliest map was drawn in ink on linen. Schoolyard stones in the hand of a corpse. Pebble from Baudelaire's oui. Stone of the mind within us, carried from one silence to another. Stone of Cromlech and Cairn, schist and shale, hornblende, agate, marble, millstones, ruins of choirs and shipyards, chalk, marl, mudstone from temples and tombs. Stone from the silvery grass near the scaffold. Stone from the tunnel lined with bones. Lava of a city's entombment. Stones chipped from lighthouse, cell wall, scriptorium. Paving stones from the hands of those who rose against the army. Stones where the bells had fallen, where the bridges were blown. Those that had flown through windows, weighted petitions, feldspar, rose quartz, blue schist, niece and shirt. Fragments of an abbey at dusk. Sandstone toe of a Buddha mortared at Bamiyan. Stone from the hill of three crosses and a crypt, from a chimney where storks cried like human children. Stones newly fallen from stars, a stillness of stones, a heart, altar and boundary stone, marker and vessel, first cast, load and hail, bridge stones and others to pave and shut up with, stone apple, stone basil, beech berry, stone break, concretion of the body, as blind, as cold, as deaf, all earth a quarry, all life a labor, stone-faced, stone drunk with hope that this assemblage of rubble taken together would become a shrine or holy place, an ossuary, immovable and sacred, like the stone that marked the path of the sun as it entered the human dawn. I realize there's one more reference to Ireland, which is the earliest map on ink on linen is the map of Belfast. Um, I will now read a poem that was given to me in testimony by a Syrian refugee from Homs. And uh, he had made his way uh, across the Aegean in one of those um, Zodiacs, the boatman. We were 31 souls, he said, in the gray sick of sea, in a cold rubber boat rising and falling in our filth. By morning this didn't matter, no land was in sight. All were soaked to the bone, living and dead. We could still float we said, from war to war. What lay behind us but ruins of stone, piled on ruins of stone? City called Mother of the Poor, surrounded by fields of cotton and millet. City of jewelers and cloakmakers, with the oldest church in Christendom and the sword of Allah. If anyone remains there now, they would be utterly alone. There is a hotel named for it in Rome, 200 meters from the Piazza di Spagna, where you can have breakfast under the portraits of film stars. There, the staff cannot do enough for you. But I am talking nonsense again, as I have since that night we fetched a child, not ours, from the sea drifting face down in a life vest, 
its eyes taken by fish or the birds above us. After that, Aleppo went up in smoke and Raqqa came under a rain of leaflets warning everyone to go. Leave, yes, but go where? We lived through the Americans and Russians, Americans again, many nights of death from the clouds, mornings surprised to be waking from the sleep of death, still unburied and alive with no safe place. Leave, yes, we'll obey the leaflets, but go where? To the sea, to be eaten, to the shores of Europe, to be caged, to camp misery and camp remain here? I ask you then, where? You tell me you are a poet. If so, our destination is the same. I find myself now the boatman driving a taxi at the end of the world. I will see that you arrive safely, my friend. I will get you there. I'd like to read a, another poem for Ireland, which is Lightkeeper. The Lightkeeper is about a, I, I love to visit lighthouses. And so when I was in Ireland, I went to quite a few, but most notably the lighthouse um, of Hook, which is across the water, I'm told from the lighthouse Crook. Um, and this is, a, like all poems, has several different subjects. Only one of them is lighthouses and their history of being lit. But may I suggest you always visit lighthouses alone and at night, because at night the lighthouse comes alive. And during the day, it's just a little building perched on the edge of the sea. The Lightkeeper, a night without ships, Foghorns calling into walled cloud. And you, still alive, drawn to the light, as if it were a fire kept by monks. Darkness once crusted with stars, but now death dark as you sail inward. Through wild gorse and sea rack, through heather and torn wool, you ran, pulling me by the hand so I might see this for once in my life. The spin and spin of light, the whirring of it, light in search of the lost. There since the era of fire, era of candles and hollow wick lamps, whale oil and solid wick, colza and lard, kerosene and carbide, the signal fires lighted on this perilous coast in the Tower of Hook. You say to me, stay awake, be like the lens maker who died with his lungs full of glass, be the you in blossom when bees swarm, be their amber cathedral, and even the ghosts of Cistercians will be kind to you. In a certain light, as after rain, in pearled clouds or the water beyond, seen or sensed water, sea or lake, you would stop still and gaze out for a long time. Also when fireflies opened and closed in the pines and a star appeared, our only heaven. You taught me to live like this, that after death it would be as it was, before we were born, nothing to be afraid, nothing but happiness, as unbearable as the dread from which it comes. Go toward the light always, be without ships. Um, I think I'd like to read a poem uh, about my grandmother who uh, immigrated from former Czechoslovakia when she was nine years old. She actually, I'm told, stowed away on a ship, but 
here it is, this is the crossing and it's for her. No matter how light it was or wet the fields and whether or not the horses from the stable down the road had broken their fence and were grazing near our windows as horses in a dream, Anna would be gone out pounding the earth with her pronged hoe. She never woke me, although I slept beside her, like sleeping near a hill wrapped in house silk. Her teeth floated in water on a nightstand where she kept her spectacles. This woman who crossed as a girl of my age in the hold of a ship for weeks, lowering her bucket of night soil by rope. Then from the sea rinsed bucket, pouring seawater over herself on the lower deck where bathing was permitted. The salt stiffened her hair and burned her eyes, but she was clean. It isn't what they tell you, Piscla, calling me the name of a little bird that sings too much. If there were no horses, cattle, or sheep to be sold, they would take people whose passage had been paid and whose forfeit put up. Our papers were in order and we had the passage and forfeit to board. They gave us drinking water, but shut off all water at night. Two weeks of the rocking boat and stink of buckets. All of us asleep on planks. Such rise and fall, such pitch of the ship. But some nights on deck, holding the rails for all her life, she said she plowed the sea as she once had the fields. And into the furrows of light went the seeds and the black winged waters fell upon them. Um, I, I'm a very close friend of, a, of an Amer American poet who actually emigrated from Ukraine, Ilya Kaminsky. And Ilya and I took a journey back to Ukraine in 2004 and also went to St. Petersburg, uh, Russia to visit the shrines of the silver poets, um, Anna Akhmatova, Oshet Mandelstam, Marina Svetaevia. And uh, we also visited Sarskia Selo where Anna Akhmatova would go in the summers of her girlhood. And there is a school there named for the poet Alexander Puskin. And, um, so we were in Puskin school in Sarskia Selo, and uh, Ilya has a profound hearing loss from having been ill as a very young child. And I remember we were standing near the window and the branch was going up and down. And he said, if you were deaf, you would assume that branch was making a sound. And I said, well, it isn't, it's not making any sound. And he said, well, that's because you can't see sound, which I thought was wonderful. And here's the poem I wrote for him, for Ilya at Sarskeselo. We stand at the casement window of Puskin's Lise. These are the desks where Puskin wrote, his chalkboards, his astrolabe. Snow falls from here into the past and vanishes on golden minarets. Snow recedes from the birches. A lesson writes itself in winter chalk. On the day Michelangelo died in Rome, Galileo was born in Pisa. Isaac Newton was born the year Galileo died. When they searched for the poet Kabir, they found nothing beneath his shroud but a sprig of jasmine. Man is like the statue, whispering about the marble chiseled from his mouth. You are the guardian of this statue, standing in your silent world. The year Isaac Newton died, there was a barn fire during a puppet show. Kabir says all corpses go to the same place. And the world has fallen in love with a dream. This life is not the same as your other life. 
You are here now in one of the shrines of the silver poets. You are one of the silver. The snow is a white peacock in a Russian poem. Um, this next poem is also for a poet whose name was Daniel Simcoe. Daniel immigrated to the United States also from former Czechoslovakia right after the invasion of 1968. And his family came from the same village as my paternal family did. So we went after the revolution, Velvet Revolution, we went back to former Czechoslovakia because Daniel wanted to get his jazz albums and his books out of an attic where he'd left them for 22 years. And I wanted to find my great aunt, Susanna Borowska. We found everything, we found her, we found everything. But on the way, on our journey, one of Daniel's suitcases was stolen. And this is a poem that came from that event. It happened in Vienna before we crossed the bridge into Bratislava. The Lost Suitcase. I would say also, I must tell you, it's an elegy now. So it was with the suitcase left in front of the hotel, cinched, broken locked, papered with world ports, carrying what mattered until then. When turning your back to cup a match, it was taken. And the thief, expecting valuables, instead, found books written between wars. Gold attic light, mechanical birds singing, and the chronicle of your country's final hours. What, by means of notes, you hoped to become. A noun on paper, paper dark with nouns. Swallows darting through a basilica, your hands up in smoke. A cloud about to open over the city, pillows breathing shallowly where you had lain, a ghost in a hospital gown. And here, your voice, principled, tender, softening through a fence woven with pine boughs. Writing is older than glass, but younger than music, older than clocks or porcelain, but younger than rope. Dear one, who even in speaking is silent, for years I have searched, usually while asleep, when I have found the suitcase, open, collecting snow, Still holding your vademecum of the infinite, your dictionary of the no longer spoken, a commonplace of wounds casually inflicted, and the slender ledger of truly heroic acts. Gone is your atlas of countries unmarked by war. Absent your manual for the preservation of ours. The incunabulum is lost, both your earliest book and a hatching place for your mechanical birds. But the collection of apersus having to do with light, laying its eggs in your eyes, was found, along with the prophecy that all mass murders were early omens. In an antique bookshop, I found your catechism of atrophied faiths. So I lay you to rest without your psalter, nor the monograph wherein you state your most unequivocal and hard-won proposition, that everything must happen, but to whom doesn't matter. Here are your books, as if they were burning. Be near now and wake to tell me who you were. So this book was published at the very beginning of the pandemic. And in fact, I was able to give one reading from it and flew home and have been in the house ever since. It was published by Blood Axe in England and they've published all of my books in the UK in recent years. And I'm very grateful to them and, uh, and to Neil Astley, who is the wonderful editor of this book there. 
Um, I'm going to go to the toward the end here, just to give you a little bit more um, before we have to stop. Um, I've been um, traveling to Vietnam a couple of times. I've been working with Joiner Center for the Study of War and its social consequences um, for the past several decades. And in recent years, we've made return trips and we've gone in the company of both US American veterans of the Vietnam War and also um, North Vietnamese veterans uh, on their side. And they're all friends now and translating each other poets on both sides of the world. Hue from a notebook. We went down the Perfume River by dragon boat as far as the pagoda of the three golden Buddhas. Pray here, you can ask for happiness. We light joss sticks, send votives down river in paper sacks then have trouble disembarking from the boat. Our bodies disembark, but our souls remain. A thousand lanterns drift. A notebook opens in the dark to a page where moonlight makes a sound. These soldiers are decades for more now. Pewter haired, steel haired, a moon caught in plumeria, we are like clouds that pass and pass. What does it matter if we are not the same as clouds? There was then the whir of stork wings and bicycle chains ringing. It is still now the way the air is still just before the mine explodes. Once we fired at each other, now we pass silence back and forth. On the 10,000 graves, we lay chrysanthemum. Morning on the island. The lights across the water are the waking city. The water shimmers with imaginary fish. Not far from here lie the bones of conifers washed from the sea and piled by wind. Some mornings I walk upon them, bone to bone, as far as the lighthouse. A strange beetle has eaten most of the trees. It may have come here on the ships, playing music in the harbor, or it was always here, a winged jewel, but in the past was kept still by a winter that no longer comes. There is an owl living in the firs, behind us, but he is white, meant to be mistaken for snow, burdening a bough. They say he is the only owl remaining. I hear him at night, listening for the last of the mice and asking who of no other owl. There are a couple of other poems for Ireland in this book, but I don't have time to read them, I'm going to close this part of the reading with a poem called Toward the End, which is fairly, fairly recent. And it's one of those poems that I have no idea why it happened, where it came from. That it's very strange. So there's no backstory here. Toward the end, in this archipelago of thought, a fog descends. Horns of ships to unseen ships. A year passing overhead. The cry of a year not knowing where. Someone standing in the aftermath who once you knew, the one you were then. A little frizzon of recognition. Then, just like that, gone. And no one for hours. A sound you thought you heard but in the waking darkness is not heard again. Two sharp knocks on the door. Death it was, you said, but now nothing. The islands, places you have been, the sea, the uncertain, full of ghosts calling out, 
lost as they are. No one you knew in your life. The moon above the whole of it, like the light at the bottom of a well, opening in iced air, where you have gone under and come back. Light, no longer tethered to your own past. And were it not for the weather of trance, of haze and murk, you could see everything at once. All the islands, every moment you have lived or place you have been without confusion or bafflement, and you would be one person. You would be one person again. Hey, thank you very much. Thank you. That was extraordinary. <laughs> I must have cried many times listening to that. Thank you. And I'm sure everyone um, feels the same way. Um, Carl and I have uh, a couple of questions for you that come from us and also our students who are uh, reading in the lateness of the world uh, this, this semester. And we also have um, questions from our attendees and a thank you from Michigan there, from Brett Griffiths. <laughs> Um, so I, I thought maybe we could just um, start the conversation in, in broad terms by thinking about, um, about poetry of witness and about uh, poetry and its connection with, with, with crisis. So I, I mean, I teach, I teach in the lateness of the world and of course your essay on poetry of witness on a module here at Maynooth called Poetry, Witness and Resistance. And we start the module with looking at your work and also looking at uh, Muriel Ruckheiser's work, which has um, kind of many cross currents, and I, I intend that pun, I think, um, with your own, especially her, um, The Life of Poetry. Mm -hmm. So in the beginning of that book, she recounts being on a boat full of refugees, sailing away from Spain at the uh, beginning of the Civil War. And she's asked by one of these refugees, you know, poetry among all this, where is there a place for poetry? Um, and she says, in times of crisis, we summon up our strength. Um, we've seen, you know, this year especially, and in the last week especially, how people turn to poetry in times of crisis. Um, and I was wondering if you would talk just a little bit more about that kind of, um, the, almost the weight of responsibility on the poet in some of these poems and in your memoir as well, um, to, to, to bear witness to that, to that crisis and to kind of communicate that crisis and maybe think about, I don't know, the use of poetry in such times. Those are many questions. <laughs> it would be a wonderful seminar <laughs> for me to answer them in. Um, I want to say that I really admired Muriel, and uh, but I never met her. However, at the end of her life, Grace Paley uh, called me and said, Muriel, you know that Muriel told me to keep an eye on you young woman, you know, because I was then publishing and, you know, I was an activist against military intervention in Central America and all of these things were going on. Anyway, she sent me out to complete the readings that she no longer felt well enough to do. It was such a, I such not a thing. I went and did the readings that she had been invited to. That's of course, you know, you can't replace Muriel Ruckheiser, <laughs> but um my thought on witness emerged in the aftermath of being considered a political poet after I published The Country Between Us, which was a pejorative term at the time. Um, politics was thought in the United States at least to not have much to do with poetry and that poets should um, very much stick to, you know, stick to the subjects of love, death, truth, and sex and nature, and but not, but not anything controversial. So, um, I realized, of course, that that couldn't be true, and I went off in search of other poets around the world. At that time, there, you know, there wasn't very much contemporary poetry coming into translation. There were uh, some wonderful American translators at the time, but they were just beginning to translate, you know, from other languages, the work of living poets. And um, and so I, I read everything and I gathered everything and I discovered that most poets around the world in the 20th century had endured conditions of extremity. And 
uh, and many, in, though, many of those in the English speaking countries as well. And so I began gathering them uh, for this anthology and I thought about what it meant to write in the aftermath of extremity, because I found that some of the poets were very much into, they, they were very reticent in their work. You, if you read carefully, you would know that here was a poet who had written in prison and here was a poet who had just been through a war, but they didn't always write explicitly about events. However, all of their, their language was marked by the impress of that extremity. It was legible in the, in the work if you looked carefully. So I thought of it as a way to read the work of poets who had endured suffering of that kind. Um, usually at the hands of the state or because of the depredations of the state, usually uh, suffering that's collectively born because of that. I didn't branch out into personal suffering, you know, as much because it would would have been too large, but that blossomed into against forgetting. And, but I never thought of it as an identity. I don't think there's any such thing as a poet of witness. There's only the work and there's only the legibility of extremity in the work. The other part of your question has to do with poetry's role in the society and how efficacious poetry can be in a time like this. Well, right now, because we are living as humanity as a whole through a horrible experience of a pandemic, um, never mind the rest of the things that are going on, and we are living through the horrors of environmental uh, decay, you know, the, the death of our biosphere. Both of those things, I believe, are marking the consciousness of all living human beings. So anything written right now is, is, is marked by that uh, internalization of those realities. So um, right now, because times are so perilous, I have noticed a turn toward poetry. And poetry is suddenly much more widely read, much more appreciated. For example, there's many, many Zoom readings now. And what's so exciting about that is that is the international audience that can be assembled. Right now, we have an audience I know is in Sweden, is in Mexico, is in the US, and is in Ireland and the UK. It's really exciting to, to know that. And um, so turning toward poetry in a time of crisis it's, is because poetry is the natural prayer of the human soul because we need deeper things. We need a greater understanding. We need a language that's alive and that enters us in a different way, that enters our hearts as well as our minds and our bodies. And that is an antidote to the decaying public uh, language, the um, language used for manipulation and propaganda, and even you know the, the flattening of language in the media all the sports metaphors and everything else that, you know, it's more and more cliched every day. We hear fewer and fewer authentic voices speaking in their own terms. What we hear are, is a language of bureaucracy and um, bureauc the bureaucracy of the state and power manipulations and so on. So what better place to go for powerful, essential language than poetry. And I do think poetry can be consoling. It can also be amusing. It can be affecting. It can touch our emotions and make us feel alive again because we can feel something. But I don't think it's useful, which is a good thing. In other words, I think poetry should stay a little bit useless. It avoids commodification. It stays pure. No one pays for it. So it doesn't have to worry about being corrupted. <laughs> or, and so I, I think in a certain way, um, poetry is abundantly necessary and probably useless. If those two things can be true at the same time. Thank you. Thanks, Carolyn. I, I'm struck in this uh, fantastic collection by uh, this, what you, what you just described, reaching beyond borders and being 
having language renovated by reaching out beyond borders. And I, I know you've translated the poems of Clarabella Allegria and Robert Desnos. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking of, I, I also know you, you love Lorca. Uh, and yes. I read a, a comment recently, uh, a remark by Miguel de Unamuno, uh, the Basque philosopher who faced down Franco's phalange. And he said, translation allowed him to glimpse horizons which he was otherwise not permitted to see. So I was wondering if you could say a little a bit about what role literary translation plays in your life and your work, and particularly now when all of our horizons have been somewhat abruptly curtailed. I feel that my life would have been absolutely otherwise and very, very, very different had I not undertaken to translate Clarivel Alegria in the summer of 1977. If I hadn't done that, I would never have gone to El Salvador. I would never have been invited by her cousin to come on the verge of war. I would never have received the education I received there. And I would never have done the work that turned me toward, toward witness. So on a very personal level, it was because of translation. People like to say that poetry can't be translated. Sometimes they like to say that literature can't be translated. Well, then we would have to give up almost all the sacred texts of the world Abrahamic religions, and we would have to give up uh, many of the of the classic texts of literature. We'd have to give up Homer. We'd have to give up Cervantes. You know, I mean, it, all of all of literature that has formed the human consciousness over centuries is because of translation. We receive them in translation. So in the beginning, as a translator, I actually thought that one translated by having a very, very good English dictionary and the, a bilingual dictionary with the language you're translating from. The dictionary is so much at the beginning of what's necessary, however, that slowly over the years, I began to realize something that Daniel Simcoe realized when he was translating Georg Trockel the uh, Austrian poet who uh, died as a result of the, really as the result of the horrors he'd seen in the Great War. Um, he said, I'm becoming Trockel. While I'm translating him, I become him. In order to really translate a poet, you have to, you have to take into yourself their sensibility, the weight of their work, the emotional weight of it, the gravitas. You, you have to you have to understand that by, I suppose, imaginatively experiencing it on, on some level. So it's not just a matter of language. It's a matter of bearing into a new language the entirety of that poem. It's music, but also it silences everything. It's, it's a very gratifying work to do. I, I did it because I was in a dry spell, I couldn't write very much and I thought it would help and I thought it would be a nice thing to do. A nice thing to do is sort of like saying it would be a nice thing to try to cross the North Atlantic on a raft, you know? It's just very, very, it's a very deep experience to translate. And um, I'm, lamentably, only 3% of books published in the United States are works in translation, literary books. That's horrific to me. When I first was gathering against forgetting, poets in the US didn't know almost any poets alive in the rest of the world. I'm still amazed at how few American poets know the Canadians and how few American poets know the living Irish poets. They, they'll know Seamus, but you know, there's, there are hundreds of poets that they should know about and also in the UK. So I've made it a kind of a life work to proselytize and to, you know, and to try to get people reading beyond their borders. It can open your mind and heart and sensibility. You can, you become larger. So not only translate, if you can translate, do try, but otherwise read in translation, read as far afield as you can. Read the poets of Iraq and Afghanistan, just as the Vietnamese, when we were with them, they actually said to some of the soldiers, by the way, when you were in training, which Vietnamese poets did they give you to read? 
And the Americans said, none, we didn't know anything about your poetry because they were given Walt Whitman. If they were gonna fight the Americans, they had to read Walt Whitman. Isn't that interesting? So, yeah. Thank you. Um, there are some questions coming in from attendees. This one is from Deb Casey, who says, thank you oh. very much uh, for your reading. Why would you suggest that we visit lighthouses alone? Or to clarify that, what, what is the benefit from traveling or taking in the experience alone? Of a lighthouse? <laughs> yes. Oh, I guess, you know, when I, when there are a lot of people who go to lighthouses. I'm, I'm not the only one. It's a thing, right? <laughs> and, but when you're, when you're with a lot of people, you know, you really want them to go away. You want to have that raw at the verge of the sea, you know, feel it, mood and feeling. And so you sort of wait around, but they're all waiting around for you to go away. So it's very hard to get yourself alone with a lighthouse the best way to do it is to go at night. And of course at night, if you stand underneath the lighthouse and look up, you can hear the light going around and around over your head. They are powerful. That light has to reach far to see. I feel sad that, you know, they're not in much use anymore as working lighthouses because of all the, you know, GPS and, you know, everything else. They're not as needed. Uh, there may be, I guess there's a romance about them, but I'll never forget standing under the Hook Lighthouse. It was two in the morning and it was, it, it was extraordinary. Now well, everyone will go to the Hook Lighthouse in the middle of the night, but Deb, Deb, how are you? I hope you're well and safe. Um, it's nice that you're here. Uh, I've got a question here. Um, you mentioned Whitman actually, and I think this this maybe speaks to to to, to Whitman's influence. Would I say something about her or not? Um, it's from Susan Elmsey. A few poems you have read have in them, for instance, the Cog of Stones in Museum of Stones and the Lost Suitcase. Could you comment on the power of lists for you in the composition process? Do they come to you, or do you consciously build them? Um, it's very interesting. I love the enumerative mode. Now, I, I've not written in that mode very much in the past, the mode of catalogs and litanies and inventories. And, but I suppose because of the times we're living through, because we're in the great sixth extinction and because we were losing so much around us, my, I found my impulse has been to name the things we're losing or to name the world, you know, to take an inventory of what, of the objects, of details of world. So um, sometimes, usually it starts out as an impulse and it just comes from nowhere. And then, and then I research it and I start building the lists and then I pare them down and then I build them again and I build them toward music. So I, I listen to these litanies. I listen to them in, as an incantation when a list is building in a poem. And there was this a book that I came across called the Encyclopedia of Ephemera. And it was about all of the different kinds of paper ephemera. You know, there's a poem about it in, in the book. And, uh, and so I grabbed all the things that fascinated me from that, put them in alphabetical order, played with the music, you know, compositionally, it's a lot of fun, but if it doesn't lift off and go somewhere and come to mean something, then it never becomes a poem. It's just a list. It, it will stay a list the way a lighthouse that never lights up is just a, a building. Um, so for me, the, the list has to come to something. It has to arrive somewhere. It has to, like, like with the Museum of Stones, become a realization about the world. So, and the, and the Museum of Stones actually ends in the passage tombs of Ireland. So that's where, that's what that reference was. Yeah. Thank you so much. And there's another poem that's all about the discovery of those passage tombs in the book called The Refuge of Art. 
because it wasn't until pilots in the Great War flew over Ireland and saw these round fields, risen domes in the fields, that they realized something was down there. And that's how they came to be discovered. Fantastic. Thank you, Carolyn. Mm -hmm. Too many questions for the time we have, but uh, there's one from Nicola Scully that I'll read because she's one of our students. Okay. Hi, yeah. Um, and we talked about, I, I suppose, the the um, the meaning of lateness. We know that the title of your collection comes from a, a Robert Duncan poem. Um, and there are many ways that we were interpreting that lateness. Her question is also about uh, something more specific, the image of the boatman, which she sees um, to read Nicola's question, specifically the final few lines as the boatman feels like a taxi driver at the end of the world, as he promises to get them there safely. When I first read it, this gave me the image of the boat traveling into the afterlife. Um, <laughs> 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 and we, um, we were thinking about the mythology of the River Styx and the kind of otherworldly um, atmosphere of much of your book and wondering if you could talk to that specific question and perhaps its relation to the idea of lateness. Well, I really want to thank that question, that questioner, because that reading of the work is perfect. It really was the River Styx that that I came to realize was this boatman. He was the ferryman. And, uh, and he actually was driving me in a taxi when he gave me the story on the condition that I would write it someday, somewhere. It took a while, but finally it did come to the page. Uh, lateness. We're all aware uneasily. We have a, a sense of foreboding in the world. I know everyone feels it. Uh, partially because, because environmental collapse has accelerated around us in visible, tangible ways. And so we don't know what time it is in human history, but, but we sense that unless something is taken in hand, unless we reverse course, unless something serious happens, we may be toward the end in terms of our, our, our ability to inhabit the, this biosphere. I'm not saying that will happen immediately, but, but we can sense within a couple of generations that it might. And, uh, and I think that's new for humanity. You know, historically, we've always made grand assumptions about, about the endurance of our environment you know, the solidity of the earth, even with earthquakes, you know, the, the predictability of the weathers, uh, which are no longer predictable. So lateness is a spiritual condition. It's probably an historical condition and it can be pursued philosophically as well. Uh, and so, and so I'm, I'm grateful for that understanding of, of this, work because it was it was assembled the poems were put together in a strange way each one suggested the next one and i knew that i was doing that something was happening in the interaction of the poems that was very different for me from previous books and it wasn't conceived as a project as a book length poem about anything it's a collection of, of discrete individual poems but they seemed to be in conversation. It wasn't until I had assembled them that I realized that how, how much they were voyaging, how much they had to do with vessels and water and bridges and movement. And, um, and so there's a kind of constel a tropic con figurative constellation of images that, that they seem to be all part of. There seems to be kind of an invisible shimmering net of these realizations cast over the whole thing. So um, that was a strange thing and I can't account for it. I know that I know that poems partially arise out of regions of mind that we're not fully conscious of. If they don't, we're often not surprised by them. I mean, they have to be 
we have to have access to those regions of mind in order to write well. So you sort of have to make discoveries. You can't, you don't think a poem in advance. The poem comes out of the pen or the pencil and it shocks you often. So in this case, it, the whole work, the whole thing surprised me because the poems were written over a course of 17 years. And some of the earliest poems seemed to know what they were doing and that they would be speaking to poems a decade away. And, you know, I can't account for the mysteries of this book. I don't understand why it happened that way. I'm not going to, I'm, I'm, you know, no, I'm just going to tread lightly around it and try not to explain it away. Thank you. I think we are coming to the end of our hour together. It has just flown by and there are many questions which um, have gone unanswered, but sort of partially answered in, in some of your wonderful, fulsome answers. So thank you for that. Thank Karen, you. and I wonder if you would re read a final poem to us to conclude the evening. I will, yes, I, I would love that. I want to thank all, all the students at Maynooth and the faculty and both of you for inviting me and for hosting this and for your wonderful questions. And um, let's, I hope very much to be in person in Ireland again before too long when we're on the other side of this. I hope you will all stay safe and healthy and um, we're gonna get through this. I wrote this poem when I was enduring, ke undergoing chemotherapy and I had to talk myself into uh, feeling that I would survive hoping I would. It begins with an epigraph by the French resistance poet René Chau. I brought from despair a basket so light, my love, that it could have been woven of willows. To speak is not yet to have spoken. The not yet of a white realm of nothing left, neither for itself nor another. A no longer already there, along with the arrival of what has been light and the reverse of light. Terror as walking blind along the breaking sea, body in whom I lived. The not yet of death darkening, what it briefly illuminates, an unknown place as between languages back and forth, breath to breath, as a calm in the surround rises, fireflies in lindens, an ache of pine. You have yourself within you, yourself. You have her, and there is nothing that cannot be seen. Open then to the coming of what comes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. I'm, I'm loath to say anything after that uh, reading. Uh, I just want to briefly thank Tracy O'Flaherty for her help in setting this up, uh, to Lauren Arrington, our head of department, and to all our colleagues in the department, and especially to Catherine, who's been a, a brilliant and inspiring with on this series of readings. But thank you, Carolyn, for for sharing such a generous and affirmative vision. We were help wrapped and uh, my colleague Una writes that her 14 year old crept in at one point and cried at your reading oh, of the oh. Boatman. Uh, well, thank you. Um, I see in I the chat reading from Achill too, and thank you. Also <laughs> uh, to, to Carl, our reading this evening, thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carl. Uh, thank you to everyone for, for being here. And again, of course, huge thanks to Carolyn Fauché for such a transporting hour of poetry and discussion, something we, we all really, really needed. Thank you. Thank um, you. As I mentioned at the start of this event, Carolyn is our inaugural guest. The next poet in our Poetry and Poetics series is the award-winning Guggenheim Fellowship holding Philip Metris, who will be joining us on December the 8th at 4 p.m. Irish time. So we look forward to seeing you there. But again, Carolyn, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. And, and, and good luck and stay safe.
Thank you so much. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.